Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good day, wherever you are. This will be our very final topic or if you like discussion for UGRC 150. We'll focus on informal fallacies. On the screen now, you see a very extensive slide. I credit my colleague. Uh, since you'll be studying and answering questions from all you know, lecturers, I would want to use this one, which I believe covers so much. You also have my own slides that I have sent to your resource too. So this one has so much content. If you're looking at the, the, the page numbering, you would see that it has a lot of examples that I think will be helpful to you. So I'm using that for the video. But if you go to the resource tool, you will get a, an abridged version of the slides on the units. So what should you know in unit 10, informal fallacies? You should know that um, we, will, we will highlight equivocation, begging the question, appeal to force, appeal to pity, appeal to the people. And they have several names. This appeal to the people have several names. I'm sure you will see appeal to the masses, mm. uh, appeal to the gallery. They all they all capture the same fallacy. We will see them shortly. Ad hominem appeal to unqualified authority. So you may appeal to an authority, but not an unqualified one. Even the qualified ones, uh, logicians may have issues sometimes how much more one that is unqualified you, you might want to call that illegitimate authority okay the person may be an authority but not in the field in question then you would see hasty generalization misplaced vividness genetic fallacy pseudo precision semi-attached figures these are the specific particular fallacies in your textbook you will see that they have been grouped take note we talk rhetorical ploys polemical tricks, different ways of, uh, if you like, manipulating people to either accept or reject a claim, polemics. Then sometimes you are persuading, but you're not actually giving reasons. Your persuasion is based on emotions. Let's see that shortly. So see, on the next slide, rhetorical ploys and polemical tricks. If the speech is designed to argue a point with the intent to manipulate the listener, take note, manipulate the listener or reader into believing there is a legitimate basis for disagreeing, for dissent. Mm. But in fact, it doesn't provide any basis. Then the argument is called a polemic. Remember, it intends to manipulate you to believe that there is a legitimate basis, but there isn't. Mm. There's a leg legitimate basis for dissenting, disagreeing. Mm. That reasoning will be called a polemical reason, a polemic. Sometimes we are moved to accept or reject claims based on psychological inducements. Something is said in connection with a claim that elicits or is intended to elicit a psychological response. Take note of the word psyche, psychological, emotions, you see, desire, fear, you see, there, there it goes. That may well induce acceptance of the, so you may just be accepting or rejecting because of an inducement psychologically, emotionally. You would see where appeal to pity, appeal to threat, etc. fall in this instance, okay? There are fallacies that are connected to emotion. You are afraid, so you would do it. Or you felt for the woman, so you would do it, appeal to pity. Okay? You may be granting someone a job in your company, perhaps because he, he or she only appealed to your, your emotions, okay? We want to be careful not to be moved by that, but by logical grounds, reasons, not your emotions. So informal fallacies, why do we label it informal? Okay, formal fallacies we saw earlier, like I prompted you in unit six, they are patterns or structures of argument which make purely logical mistakes and are therefore invalid. So we, we saw what it means to have a logical relation Modus ponens, tolens, and the others have their conclusions logically deduced from their premises. For fallacies that pretend to be like modus ponens and the like, 
and do not succeed. They are deducing, yes, but the deductions are done incorrectly. We have labeled one, the fallacy of affirming the consequent, the fallacy of denying the antecedent, etc. In, in those units, unit six specifically, look at the various parts are presented to you. You would see that we labeled those fallacies as what? Formal fallacies, and I explained that. They are errors. Fallacy just means error, mistake. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. Okay. So an error of the form. They didn't obey a certain given pattern of reasoning deductively. Okay. Now, informal fallacies are not necessarily an error and mistake. So take note, I'm reading now. Errors and mistakes to do with the content of inductive arguments. Okay. So for informal fallacies, we are not necessarily disobeying any rule of deduction. Mm -hmm. We are actually engaging in informal discourse. The defective arguments often use rhetorical ploys. When we, when we are using rhetoric, pasade, sweet language, to, to beat traffic, so to speak, to make the person get so persuaded. Here, the intention may not necessarily be to manipulate you to disagree or to dissent, as is the case with what? Polemical ploys or polemical tricks. But here, it is sweet language. That's how I tell, I distinguish the two for my students. And they don't really differ. You know, rhetorical ploys. You use sweet language. So sometimes you appeal to how many people are supporting the claim. Say, oh, this thing is a good product. Because a lot of people. So what you are doing is rhetoric, sweet language. But it is a ploy to attract the customer's attention to what how many people are buying it, and not necessarily the quality of the product. Okay, so kinds of informal fallacies. Why would we say kinds? Just to give it, you know, a certain level of categorization. We have fallacies, informal fallacies that are related to relevance. We, we call it an error of reasoning that uh, we think that is arising because that reasoning, that evidence you are providing is not relevant to the discussion. That's how can we think of it as what? Uh, fallacy. So the, the, the problem we have with those kinds of fallacies is that they are irrelevant. The, the premises you are offering are irrelevant to the conclusion you are drawing. So where the premises are not logically relevant to the conclusion, for example, changes the subject, you see that we say that there are fallacies of relevance. You see all of these in your textbook, maybe not rounded up nicely like that. So fallacies of weak induction, where the premises are relevant to the conclusion, yes, but they do not support the conclusion in the way intended, see. Uh, this one might sound a bit technical, but here, yes, you are presenting evidence, but, and the evidence is connected, but perhaps you are using that small data to draw a certain big conclusion uh, that the data is not able to ground, for example. So we feel that it is, it, it, uh, the, the premises do not support the conclusion in the way intended. Okay, then we have fallacies that manipulate language and statistics. I think you, you would have seen this already. When you are reasoning in circle or when you are being equivocal, remember equivocation, you are just manipulating the language. You're making us think that being responsible is the same as, I mean, remember our example, the, the boss wants a, uh, to appoint someone who is responsible to that office. And then the, the appointee says, oh, I think I'm the one you're looking for because the company I worked in before coming here, whenever something gets missing, they said I was responsible. <laughs> so that was a, a manipulation of language. This, this one wouldn't go well for the, the, the candidate anyway, but that was an, an example of what equivocation. I wanted you to remember that. So we could manipulate language. And I say, oh, she's very, very, very uh, logical. Or she's very moral. You, I mean, this girl is a good girl. You are going to have a good time with her. She's a moral girl. She, she has a moral aptitude, a high moral aptitude. So I say, why? They say, why do you say so? I say, oh, she's moral, though, because she really leads a moral life. This, this, this is not any evidence I have provided. I just repeated morality. Okay, so you should better ask for content because I am just manipulating the language. Maybe I don't even know I'm doing that. She's moral because she leads a moral life. What is the reason of it? You haven't given any reason yet. You just repeated 
what morality. So you are telling me that I should marry the lady because she's moral. Then I ask you, I mean, give me reasons. So, oh, she's moral because she leads a morally upright life. Manipulation of language. We are going to develop the nation because you remember all those examples. So when you are just playing on language or sometimes you are playing on the statistics, the data, the evidence available, we will say you are committing those kinds of fallacies that fall within that range. So these are just main categorizations. We'll look at the specifics shortly. Now, see on the screen, you have one equivocation. I'm going to run through them because you would, you would, you are able to play it back again and again and again. And it's quite a number of slides. We want to make sure we have covered it for you, for you to get all the various perspectives. This is from a colleague, so you will have another perspective. And in mind, you will see a, a bit more a, a summarized version for easy understanding. So you, 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 you connect the two and you are good to go. Look at the equivocation. We met it already. This would be a fallacy that manipulates language. So if you look in your textbook, you, you're in a 10, you see the three categorizations. This will be one type that manipulates language. Okay, it manipulates language because it plays on the different meanings of one word without a notice. Look on the screen. And the intention is to persuade. Okay, look at the interviewer. Aha, uh -huh. this example I told you about. In this job, we need someone who is responsible. That's the interviewer, then the applicant. Then I'm the one you are looking for. In my last job, every time anything went wrong, they said I was responsible. <laughs> okay. I think you get the drift there. Person is manipulating language. More examples. Happiness is the end of life. The end of life is death. Therefore, happiness is death. Now, uh, I'm sure you are seeing that the person is presenting a supposed ground, see, for the conclusion they are drawing. But the person is playing. When I say happiness is the end of life, and someone says the end of life is death, therefore, happiness is that that looks like a good hypothetical solution I thought. <laughs> well, but the person is playing on the meaning of happiness and life and end and death. So it is in that context that I think my colleague thinks of this as an equivocation. I want to have myself a merry little Christmas. Okay, so we can go on and on and let's move. Look at for noisy children are a real headache. You saw it earlier. Two aspirin will make a headache go away. Therefore, two aspirin will make noisy children go away. This is these are all equivocal uh, speeches. Okay, we have to be smart enough to point that out. It is a fallacy that manipulates language. The second one, begging the question. Remember, we met it. Secular reasoning, it's also called a uh, uh, tautology. Mm -hmm. And here you can see the Latin expression. I don't know how much of it you want to keep, but maybe pictorially you let your eyes see it. Petitio principi. Okay. Petitio principi. Don't get all worked up. <laughs> I hope we don't get to be examined on those, you see, but we do, I don't decide alone, neither uh, does any of my colleagues. We, we, we put all together, so I don't know. But just know that begging the question, petition principi, it's also called alias, eh? Another name for it is secular reasoning, petition principi. You can even see tautology, and they all work around the same thing. Remember it. When we're doing definitions, we saw the same thing. Begging the question is an attempt to prove the conclusion of an argument by using that conclusion as a premise. So you go in circles. When I use development is to develop the nation and back on the road. That was uh, that fallacy in a definition. Okay. But here in argument, you present your evidence and then your conclusion is itself captured in the press, uh, uh, in the what? In the premise. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Uh, you, you won't always see a repetition of the same thing, but look at this. He said the Book of Mormon is true because it was written by Joseph Smith. Just Joseph Smith wrote the truth because he was divinely inspired. We know that Joseph Smith was divinely inspired because the Book of Mormon says that he was. And the Book of Mormon is true. Okay, so I'm sure you see this, the circularity that we started with trying to establish why the book is true. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, we gave it credence by saying, oh, because of who it was written by, as Joseph Smith, who was himself inspired. Mm -hmm. And then we know that 
he was inspired. How do we know that he was inspired so that it can support our claim that the book is true? Or well, we say we know he was inspired because the book tells us so. <laughs> we are back where we started. Okay, that's what makes it begging the question. We go in circle. And sometimes perhaps that's the only way we can we can ground our beliefs and our claims in God. Okay. If we don't want to go in circles, then we, we ask for divine grace. The Bible says that God exists. The Bible is true because God wrote, therefore God exists. Okay. So this is also another good example of uh, secularity. We are we support the claim of the Bible by appealing to the author of the Bible or the ultimate originator of this scripture. This goes for all holy texts, really sincerely. Okay, so we say God makes the Bible authentic, yet we prove God's existence by the Bible. Okay, so, so it, that, that suggests some secularity. People who lack humility have no sense of beauty because everyone who has a sense of beauty also has humility. Well, I'm sure you get it now. You don't need to go too far to, to make the point. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that this slide, so you are watching, so you can always check the two. The second one does not beg the question. See, everything the Bible says is true. The Bible says that God exists. Therefore, it is true that God exists. That one is not secular. But the first one is supporting the authenticity of the Bible by appealing to what God says. Okay. And yet, at the same time, is authenticating what God says by appealing to the Bible. When we reason this way, then it goes in circle. You ground one's evidence on the basis of the other, and then still use the other one, which is supposed to be the premise now, as your conclusion. I think the point is well made. Then there is a third fallacy, appeal to force. Appeal to force is not necessarily a fallacy that is manipulating language. This one is diverting your attention. So it's a fallacy that changes the subject. In your text, I've said already, there are three categorizations you see there. You see fallacies that manipulate language, fallacies that manipulate data, and fallacies that change the subject. Okay. The first two we saw are um, fallacies that manipulate the language. Okay, this one is one of the fallacies that changes the subject. It, it diverts your attention from the discussion to what? The emotional trauma you are facing. This, this one is not just emotion, it's force. I threaten you. I show you what the consequences will be if you don't obey. Scatter this. So see my colleague puts scatter this here. Appeal to threat, appeal to fear, appeal to consequences. These are all one way of describing that same fallacy due to force, okay? Threat, fear, consequences. Kwame, Kwame, sweep the room. If you don't sweep the room, I will show you who will give you food this evening. <laughs> okay, consequences, consequences. So it means the reason why we sweep the room is because you give us food. Then if I'm able to do some quick, ajala uh, one, ajala two, and get some two cities, I won't sweep, I won't bath. Kwame, you haven't bath. Kwame, when you are here, I won't did you don't bath, you will not eat. So Kwame must bath because, see the because, because he's supposed to be giving you reasons why he should bath, because there comes the answer from mommy. If he doesn't bath, he will not eat. This is a few to threat. Tell Kwame that Kwame, if you don't bath, you will smell too. Before long, it will be a stench on you. Even marrying will be difficult. It is still reasons you are offering. They sound consequential, but you are not using the consequences to threaten him or to scare him. So let's look at some examples. See the Latin expression for that argumentum ad baculum, the argument of force, baculum, okay? I'm, I'm mentioning them because perhaps you might see them. Coercing you to believe or accept a conclusion by shifting the focus away from the belief or conclusion's veracity and instead drawing attention to what will happen to you if you don't believe or accept it, okay? You can avoid being harmed by accepting this statement. That's, that's the nature of uh, that, okay? This statement is true or this argument is good. Let's look at some examples. I'm just saying that instead of giving you reasons why you should accept the claim, you are shown 
or threatened or you are scared, you are giving a scary consequence. Mm. Threat, fear. That's why we call it appeal to force. You are using force. My sister, don't let anybody, don't force anyone to love you. <laughs> it won't last. Don't force politicians. You shouldn't force people to become your supporters. Force church folks. You don't force people to believe in anything. Give them reason. Mm? They will love you even if you are in the gutters. Okay. Appeal to force. Example. Example one. Lately, there has been a lot of negative criticism of our policy on dental benefits. It's quite long. Let me tell you something, people. If you want to keep working here, see, there comes a threat. You need to know that our policy is fair and reasonable. Anybody working here who doesn't know this will have to leave. <laughs> That's a frustrated uh, uh, boss. He doesn't know this will have to be let go. If you don't know that our policy is fair and reasonable, you have to be sacked. Hey, <laughs> then I'll go early, Papa. Two, I know that some of you oppose the president's nomination of before as a new DC. Well, do you still want the government to continue with the free SHS policy? That's a threat already. Do you want the president to bring development projects to our district? It's still a threat. If Kupo is not approved, it may become necessary to stop the free SHS and other projects in the district. I, I'm sure you get it now, and so there are more. This is quite interesting, let's see. Johnny, of course, I deserve the use of your bicycle for the afternoon. I like that one. After all, I'm sure you wouldn't want your mother to find out that you beat your little sister today. <laughs> and so if you don't want mommy to find out that you beat little sister today, then I ride the bike the whole day. That's the reason why this is very, very uh, clear. I'm sure it will help most of you, okay? So it is threatening the brother, not giving reasons why he should be allowed to ride a bike. Look at four, either you marry me right now or I'll be forced to leave you and never speak to you again. I'm sure you wouldn't want me to do that. Therefore, you marry me right now. Mercy on you. So those were examples of appeal to threat, or appeal to force, argumentum ad baculum. It changes the subject from giving me reasons why I should marry him or not marry him, or I should give him my bicycle to ride. He rather threatens, or shows me the consequences. If you don't vote for it. your textbook has another example. It says if you don't support uh, so, so and so's candidate as yes, as the president, then a lot of people will not be your friends here. And after school, you won't get schoolmates. And finding a job will even be difficult because you need schoolmates who are connected to help you get a job. All of those are the reasons why you should support a candidate of that guy who wants to be an SRC president. Cheap argument, highly fallacious, which fallacy appealing to threat, appealing to force, appealing to what? Consequences. It is a scare tactic. We are not scared. Okay. Four, appeal to pity. It also diverts attention. So we call it the, one of the fallacies that changes the subject. Okay. You can link it to which one is relevant and which one is not. Remember the one up there, we saw fallacies of relevance. It will be relevant if you like. Appeal to pity is called what? Appeal to emotion or sympathy. That's another name for it, emotion, okay? Sympathy, pity. Look at the Latin expression. There it comes, argumentum ad, see, I, I, I tell students, look at this, like misery, mm? sadness, misericordia, mm? misery. Argumentum ad, misericordia, misery, emotion, pity. There's a funny one said about it, a, a boy who killed both of his parents. He said that he's guilty. And then when they sentenced him to life imprisonment or something, he said, please have mercy on me. I'm an orphan. <laughs> please have mercy on me because I'm an orphan. Who made you an orphan? Now you have killed your parents and you are going to use that to appeal to our emotions. You know how in the law court, some woman will come and say, Auntie Judge, Auntie Judge, you're a woman like me. Madam Judge, you are a woman like me. Meanwhile, you are going to pour acid on someone's daughter because she was following your husband. Yes, she was, and that's not right. But you poured acid on her, forgetting that she's a woman like you. Now that you are being centered, say you are a woman like me. Please, I have children. Be merciful on me. That is appeal to pity emotions. You know, people go for interview, some fine sister. She says, I'm on you. I tell you all the time. You know, she's in the queue, and then when she, 
10 for the interview, they asked, why do you think you qualify for this job? Give us reasons why we should give you this job. You know, he looks at them and with a sad face, he said, I've suffered. I've really suffered though. my life. Everything I do, I have to struggle and talk right now. But as I speak with you, my mother is sick. I'm telling you, I've not paid my school fees. I had to walk all the way from so and so and so. And now, even the queue we are in, I'm, I'm the only girl amongst them, the only lady. So, hey, appeal to pity, I'm telling you. All the bad things that you believe have happened to me are supposed to come together to strengthen you. You can re refer to them without sounding all pitiful. You don't play on those. If I'm on the panel, when I close and I have some money, I'll give you, but I can get the job because we don't want to do welfare with our company. You look straight in the eyes of the panel. You stand straight and you confidently tell them, I think I qualify for this job as a marketer. I'm able to market this product because the kind of background I've had has shown me that with little resources, I'm able to blah, blah, blah. As, as I speak with you, I have a sick mother, I have this, I have that, but I'm able to reconcile all of that and still make sure she's doing fine now and I'm in the queue and facing some brothers over there, but I believe that my qualification speaks louder. I'm saying the same thing. I'm not invoking that to attract attention. Appeal to pity. You don't do that. No, please. No, please. If you don't help me, see some examples that Dr. Pesi gives us. Let's, let's look at the example one. Please say, I deserve a better mark than an F. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I deserve a better dessert. You think? <laughs> Please, I deserve a better mark than an F for you, GIC 150. Look, look at the reason the person is going to look. My parents just got a divorce. If they see that I got an F, they will just blame each other. The fighting will start all over again, and I'll be very sad. That's the reason why the person says he deserves a better mark than an F. I leave you to judge that. Example two, you really ought to vote for Jane as MP for Ayawaso. Poor Jane has faced one adversity after another her whole life. There they go. You know, she was born into dire poverty. Both her parents died when she was in blah, 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 blah. So what? So she should be voted as what? Mahama. Eh, excuse me, as eh, who? The Mahama should be voted as MP. Fire was. <laughs> that cannot be the way to reason. It is appeal to pity. There's more examples. We want to make our video relatively shorter so you can go through them. There it is on the screen. I, I think I have some also on what I uploaded. Okay. See, there comes the next one. So we have looked at four. The first two man, uh, manipulate language, secularity, and equivocation. The next three that we have seen, this one included, divert attention. They change the subject. Okay, They shift your attention from giving you reasons to what? Touching on something, either your emotions or appeal to pity. Fragmentum ad misericordium, or the other one, appeal to threat. You threaten you. So you are not looking at the reason he or she is offering you. You are looking at the consequences, the threat, the force. Finish typing these letters before 12 30. Otherwise, consider yourself fired. That is the boss, the secretary. So she is typing like a machine, not because they have a deadline to meet and together they are going to make sure that the company progresses and she has to bring her so that the colleagues will look at it. Not, not those. The reason is you don't finish typing by 2.30, you are fired. You see, so she's working like a machine. What if she gets another job before a very well-paid job? She will drop your company like a piece of paper. See? So you appeal to people's reason, even if you got another job, you say, well, I can't do this for our company. We had such and such deadline. We are trying to win, uh, you know, something. So let me do my bit before I even exit. See, reason than force. Now to appeal to the people. Look at the several names it has. The Latin expression, argumentum ad populum. It is called grand standing. French people, grand, you know, big, big stand. What the plenty people say, bandwagon, appeal to the masses. Plenty people say, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Hey, hey. They crucify the savior. Plenty people voted uh, uh, ex-president into power. Before long, four years after, plenty people voted him out. 
plenty of people now, supposedly, have, have, you see, I'm talking about the fact that the fact that plenty of people, majority or the populace said something, doesn't in itself make it right or wrong. So if you don't have any reason to give me, don't tell me, be everyone says it is good. So you are putting my pony on my forehead and I ask you, why do you want to put my pony here? I want it at the back. So now, and then the end, now that's what everyone is doing now. Am I everyone? Mm -hmm. I'm not everyone. So if the sole reason or basis for accepting or rejecting a view or practice is because a large number of people support it, then you are the most pitiable of all, of all who say. You should have reason why the plenty people follow the thing. Look for the reason why, even if plenty people are following it, what is the reason why they are following that? Oh, it is durable. Okay, so I follow that product because it's durable. Oh, it is economical. You buy just a little, you, 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 you blend it, it becomes plenty. So you can feed plenty when the quality is the same. Then I follow that. So there a lot of people are following it, yes, but that is not what I give attention to. Most people or all people accept this claim. Therefore, we should accept it to be true. It's a big fallacy. Let's read one or two of the examples. We have several of them. I think I should commend my colleague for that. You should read Manasi Azuri's latest novel right away. It sold over a million copies and practically, see, practically everyone in the media is talking about it. So that is why I should also go and read it, talk about it. See that that's the problem. We don't have, we don't want that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jane, I can't believe you don't have a smartphone yet. Why? Practically everybody today has one. Surely you will buy one right away. Surely you buy one right away. Okay. You say why practically every, everybody today has one. That's what makes it what appeal to the masses. We move fast. But officer, I don't deserve a ticket. That is a ticket as in, I don't deserve to be arrested. This sounds a bit uh, European or if like non-Ghanaian, the, the, the language there. But the point is, I don't deserve a ticket as in, you don't have to arrest me or give me a charge. Everyone goes this speed. See who is speaking there. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone goes this speed. See, this highway, we all, you only me are arresting me. All of us, we, we, we jump the traffic. You see? Hmm. Example four, it is well recognized by most people that the present technological revolution has affected, I think we have enough for um, appeal to <clears throat> the masses. It is on the screen for those who would still want to take it. Next one. Also changing the subject. So your textbook gives you six fallacies that change the subject. Ad hominem is one of them. The fallacy of the person, against the person, attacking the person. This attack need not be interpreted as physically picking a, a club or something and hitting someone and said, Poo, no. It's an attack as in you leave the issue and you discuss the person. It's straightforward, argumentum, Ad hominem, look, homo sapien, man, hominem. Okay, so argument of the person, argument against the person mm, or man attacking the person. So when you, we are discussing and you leave the issue and you are talking about the person, he cannot be president because he's too short. That's the cheapest, you know, ad, uh, ad hominem I could think of in, re in a recent past in Ghanaian politics. He, I, he, we shouldn't vote him as president. Why? Because he's too short. It's a joke ad hominem. And that one, where you give reasons why the, the view should not be accepted, we call it geologistic. We'll see it in a minute. Hey, excuse me. We call it dislogistic. Dislogistic, negative, dislogistic. Okay. Then where you want us to accept a view because of the person's circumstances. So you have left the issue, but who he or she is. Uh, things about the person. We say you are eulogizing the person. That is positive eulogy. See, we sing a eulogy for people, or we we we, uh, we speak a eulogy for people. Uh, when we, we think that we have lost them and then all our fake. Oh, he was a good man. So we eulogize. Eulogize means you are talking about the positives about the thing. 
a person. Okay, so you leave the issue and you are discussing positive circumstances. I think we should accept what Dr. Miles says. Why? Oh, because she attends my church. She is, so she, um, what example can I give? And so you have left the issue. So we should off the fan or keep it on at the lecture hall. Someone says, oh, I, I don't think we should uh, keep the fan on. Then the colleague says, Doc, I don't mind that boy there. So we say, ah, why shouldn't we keep the fan on? He says, oh, that boy that asked, asked us to keep it on. He thinks because he attended Achimota school, so he can impose himself on us. His father is rich, so what? We are here. You know, the, the, the whole issue is no longer about the fan. It's about the person, the school he attended, his father, their riches. Perhaps you are jealous of him. Okay. So let's see some examples of ad hominem, both the eulogistic, the positive one, where you say accepted because of the person's circumstance, and then the dislogistic, which says don't accept, don't accept because of negative so and so and so. Okay, example one, don't mind what he says. You know what, uh, you know that he's a lying, ignorant NPP man who has a personal interest in the matter. This is ad hominem. Okay, Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy is not where the paper it's print, printed on. Nietzsche was an immoral reprobate who went completely insane from syphilis before he died. There we go. Three, Professor Addison's argument in favor of the theory of evolution should be discounted. Addison is a cocaine snorting sex pervert. <laughs> and according to some reports, a member of the Communist Party. All of these are supposed to show instances where you have left the issue and you are discussing or attacking the person. The attack may be a positive one, amazingly. You see, when we say attack, you may be asking us to accept on the basis of certain evidence. You will see in your textbook, you too, or look who is talking fallacy. It's called Tew Cook, those who speak some French. You will see it as a subset of ad hominem. It is part of the ad hominem uh, reference there. Since it is mentioned in this slide and we are all going to engage, I want you to give it some attention. So it is also a fallacy to cook, you too. Like you also like that. Don't come and talk about my own. We are all the same. Or you, who, who is coming to tell me to, to be moral? If we want people who are immoral, it's not you. So you are not addressing the issue. You are throwing it back at the person because they have the same baggage, sort of. Okay, it's called to cook fallacy. Don't see that the friend version here. You see you too, or look who is talking. Okay, let's see some examples of two cook. I said it has been placed under your ad hominem there as a subset, you know, as instances of ad hominem. So here you are attacking the person by telling him you are like that. So don't come and talk about my, you are like that. That tells me I shouldn't lie. He says lying is wrong because it makes people stop trusting one another. But I've heard my dad lie sometimes. I've heard my dad lie. Sometimes he calls in sick to work when he isn't really sick. He calls to tell the work folks that he's sick when he isn't really sick. So lying isn't actually wrong. Okay. Uh, let's let's. I think this one will capture it better. The Chinese one. That rep from China has argued that our trade policies violate human rights. But China's own record on human rights is abominable. Just at that stage, you can conclude that is stupid. Because the fact that their own record, even if it's the case, eh, violates human rights, doesn't mean they cannot argue that our trade policies violate human rights. So when you tell them, look at who is talking. If we want people to come and correct us, should it be the China folks? This is from the speaker there. Eh? Does China regularly execute prisoners just to salvage their body parts? That representative should keep his mouth shut. They, they, this Chico fallacy, which is under, if you like, the broad category called ad hominem. You are telling them that, who, 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 who are you to come and correct us, okay? But you see that here is not a person, it's an institution. That's why we, we give it a, <laughs> its own space and call it what you cook or to cook fallacy. This logistic, and you logistic. Please remember up there that the Chiu Kok fallacy, you don't see Chiu Kok here, you see you too. Or if you like, look who is talking kind of fallacy. Okay. After that, then we come to this logistic and eulogistic at hominem. I've already mentioned that. Let's read. 
if the facts cited about the person associated with the conclusion are negative, I told you, negative, and detracting from the person's integrity or worthiness or confidence, then the fallacy is called dislogistic. So if I'm saying negative things, you shouldn't accept him. He himself he was a pervert. He did X, Y, and Z. Therefore, he cannot be this. And we say it's logistic, negative. Okay. But if we have pleasant and laudatory facts, mm, and we are citing that, even though it sounds good, it is still attacking the person. Oh, we should, I think we should accept what the doc says. Like, hey, Dr. Miles attended the Phantom Man Girls. She's really this and she's that, and she does this, and she does that, which is not connected to the issue. It says there's things about her. <clears throat> Excuse me, we say we are eulogizing the person. It's still ad hominem, the broad fallacy code, but ad hominem. We don't want you to leave the issue and discuss the person and this or his circumstance. If you did that, whether it is logistically or eulogistically, it is still ad hominem and it is a fallacy. Okay. So many of them for you to munch on. Mm -hmm. Look at Ken. See, the finance minister, Mr. Ken Ubuyata, is the most honest and eloquent person to hold this office. Therefore, his argument for increasing taxes <laughs> cannot possibly be flawed. Woo. That's ad hominem. Where will you place it? It's a eulogistic one. You eulogize the person to ground the claim about taxes. His claims about, he might be the honest and eloquent person. Think of him, we think of him, but that is not enough grounds to support a supposed claim of increasing taxes. Okay, so we say you are eulogizing the person. I think there's an example about this logistic. Christine has argued persuasively that parliament should support stem cell research involving fetal tissue. A Christ, Christine, I think it's Christine, a Christine has no morals at all. She has sex with any man who walks through the door and she has had three abortions. No one with morals should listen to her. This is this logistic. We are discussing stem cells research involving fetal issue. We are not discussing people's morality, let alone that of Christine, the speaker. So that should drive home the point. The next, appeal to unqualified authority. Your textbook will say illegitimate appeal to authority. So you are appealing to an authority, yes, but this authority is not qualified mm, to speak to that specific matter. That's why we say it is an illegitimate appeal to authority. See the Latin expression, argumentum ad Vericundium. <laughs> Argumentum ad vericundium. The fallacy occurs when you make an unjustified appeal to an alleged authority, but such an appeal is unjustified either because his or her area of competence lies outside the field in which the matter falls, or he or she is not adequately informed. You see that. So I always give this example. Um, suppose we wanted to talk about something, okay, there are examples here, let's use those so we, we have, we are safe. But we all know, know our Ghanaian Lewin, this good actor, very, very funny. Yeah, I think he's also a business person. But suppose he talks and says that COVID-19 vaccine is very good and so everyone should, should get it. And he's speaking to World Health Organization. Will we, will we be happy with that? Will they be authoritative enough if he's talking about how to act and act well, or he's he's making uh, giving us some tips about how to make people laugh and stuff like that, then we may say he's an authority, but not in discussing COVID-19 vaccine and which one is more viable and effective than the other. It will be the wrong authority to appeal to. See, that's the, that's the issue. So our pastor says that prayer in public schools is not unconstitutional. Therefore, we must conclude that such prayer is perfectly legal. Legality is not pastoral. Okay. So you are appealing to the wrong authority. It might be an authority, might, might give you, you know, projections on you know spiritual matters, can open out scripture and help you understand than what even the professor might do, an academic professor that doesn't know scripture. So you see. He can be an authority somewhere, but not in matters of legality. You need a legal luminary, a legal brain for that. The screen has another fine example for you. Then we move quickly to hasty generalization. We met this when we looked at enumerative induction, unit seven. I showed you that in enumerating, you can 
get 100 examples of women that cheated. And therefore, you want to conclude that all women are cheats. That reasoning is you are generalizing in a haste, open, you are in a haste, uh, hurrying to generalize too much. Okay. If you have that in mind, you know exactly what kind of fallacy this is. You have some instances, yes, some example, some data, yes, but you are manipulating that data to ground a quick conclusion that you are, you are drawing. That's why this fallacy manipulates data. It is not manipulating language and it is not changing the subject. This one is what manipulating the data, the evidence available to you. It is blowing the evidence out of proportion. That's what, look at it, we say it's called jumping to a conclusion. You have some evidence, but you, you wanted to cover things that the evidence is not able to do. Okay. Let's see some examples. Yesterday, two students were diagnosed as contracting the coronavirus. Today, two more were given the same diagnosis. It is obvious we have an epidemic. <laughs> Everyone on campus has coronavirus. Uh -huh. You interview one or two people or you research and you found out that two people have corona and you conclude, hey, everyone is sick of corona at Ligon. That's problematic. It's called hasty generalization. You are generalizing in a haste. Okay, so we move on. The third one, these are all examples. I think that one is straightforward. You don't need to. Okay, so let's read the next one. Misplaced vividness misplaced vividness see when an emotional impact causes a person to jump to a conclusion so see how this is related to hasty generalization but here you are being vivid emphasis you are placing emphasis that is not uh, that emphasis is misplaced you are being vivid about something but where you are placing the emphasis doesn't help the matter you are drawing a conclusion based on a certain emphasis mm, that is misplaced, a certain vividness that is misplaced. You shouldn't place it there. Okay, let's give an example. When an emotional impact causes a person to jump to a conclusion or a hastily generalize <coughs> experience, a small number of dramatic and vivid events are taken to outweigh a significant amount of statistical evidence. Okay, let's, let's get the example. I think the example will help you. I am giving up extreme sports now because I have children. Now that I have children, I, will, I think I'll take up golf. That was Anne. Anne says, I'm going to stop, you know, serious active sport. I will just do something minor and more engaging, like golf. Then Bill tells him, hey, I wouldn't do that. Do you remember Charles? So Bill is the one committing that fallacy that will label us what misplaced vividness. Said, do you remember Charles? He was playing golf when he got hit by a golf cart. As soon as the sister says she wants to do golf, look at Bill's reaction. And the reaction has evidence, yes, but that evidence is not enough to ground the claim he's going to make. Not just that, that is not enough. It is misplaced. So let's look at why it is misplaced. He was playing golf when he got hit by a golf cart. It broke his leg and he fell over, giving himself a con concussion. He was in hospital for a week and still walks with a limp. I will stick to paragliding. I mean, Charles got all these this events happening. It wasn't pleasant. It has, has had an emotional impact on Bill. But to conclude therefore that it is wrong to engage in golf, that he wouldn't do that. It's misplaced. You see, it's, it's a hasty, generalizing in a haste based on a certain emotional event you had in the past, something that wasn't too pleasant. That is what is actually inspiring the hasty generalization. That's why we will call this one a misplaced vividness. Something unpleasant has happened and it is fueling your, your jumping to conclusion. Jane, that's an example two now on the screen. I've been thinking about getting a new laptop. Then Bill responds, what sort of laptop do you want to get? And Jane said, well, it has to be easy to use, have a low price and have decent processing power. 
I've been thinking about getting an RLG laptop. I read in that consumer magazine that they have been found to be very reliable in six independent industry studies. Now look at Bill's re response. I wouldn't get the RLG laptop. I won't get it. Why? A friend of mine bought one a month ago to finish his master's thesis. He was halfway through it when smoke started pouring out of the CPU. <laughs> he didn't get his thesis done on time. And he lost his financial aid. Now he's selling Bofoot on the street. <laughs> and then Jane quickly said, hey, I guess I won't go with the RLG laptop then. Now, this is jumping to conclusion, okay? So it seems to be hasty generalization. But look at what is inspiring the hasty generalization. It is an unpleasant one-off mm, emotional event that happened. So we will call this a misplaced vividness. It is hasty generalization inspired by what? An, a, an event in the past that wasn't pleasant. Okay. That's, that is it. <clears throat> Sorry, there's more. You see all of that. Uh, cigarette smoking can be as harmful as people say. It's also interesting. Let me see if I can read it quickly for you. I'm put three on misplaced vividness. Yes, I read the side of the cigarette pack about smoking being harmful to your health. That's the surgeon. That's the surgeon general's opinion. Him and all his statistics, you see. But let me tell you about my uncle. So this person is trying to refute, disagree that cigarette smoking being harmful is anything to go by. He thinks that it, it cigarette smoking is not really an issue. Yeah, it is just a Surgeon General's opinion, and you know, it's up to them. But he has an evidence that he can produce to show that we can't let that really matter. What is the evidence? Let me tell you about my uncle. Uncle Sam has smoked cigarettes for 40 years now. And he's never been sick a day in his life. He even won the Milo Marathon in his age group last year. You should have seen him running from Tema to Dansuma. He smoked a cigarette during the award ceremony and he had a broad smile on his face. I was really proud. I can still remember the cheering. Cigarette smoking can't be as harmful as people see. One emotional impact, this one was pleasant though, but it is still an emotional instance that the person had. He wants to say that because of what he knows about Uncle Sam, that one Uncle Sam and how he has weathered the storms, if there are any, around what smoking cigarette, he can conclude that therefore cigarette smoking is not or may not be harmful to our health against the, the surgeon's you know, opinion. That is misplaced vividness. So you see how you can connect that to hasty generalization. Okay, you can move quickly. See some more examples in your text. Some overlap anyway. So then genetic fallacy from the word genesis. We met it when we looked at causal fallacies. What we did unit nine, causal reasoning. After post hoc, a group of hoc and the co cohorts there, a confusing cause with effect, etc. We saw genetic fallacy. You accept or reject because of the genesis of it. It's genesis. The phone you are using was manufactured in China, so it must be a fake one. This is a genetic class. The new undergraduate system is a copy of the American university system. So it must be an improvement over what we had before. This is a fallacy, genetic one. It's in your textbook. You're not going to wear a wedding ring, are you? Don't you know what the wedding ring originally symbolized? You know? And then the person goes on women to, it was worn by women to prevent blah, 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 blah. So the person is telling you to not to wear the ring because of the origin of wearing of rings, the genesis of it, the genetic fallacy. Was born to Catholic parents and raised as a Catholic until his confirmation DHS. Therefore, he's bound to want to defend some Catholic traditions and therefore cannot be taken seriously. This one, you see, when we when we, we are finishing, you see a point I can make here. It seems to be attacking the person, if you could see that, almost a feminine dyslogistic. At the same time, it is connecting to the person's antecedents. Don't, uh, don't think of him differently because after all, he's a Catholic. He will speak this and so. So there is an overlap there. But at this stage, we want to show you the bit about this speech that is what genetic fallacy. Because of the source, accept or reject. There are quite a number of others. 
let's and then we'll show you the 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 bit that talks about multiply flawed speeches. It has different flaws, different uh, errors. It is committing more than one fallacy. One person may be committing more than one fallacy. People come to hospital, they have heart attack. Another person may just come with a headache. Another one may just come with a stomach pain. Another pregnancy. But some two will come with pregnancy. That at the same time, that person has a heart attack. And at the same time, you know, has an appetite issues and has to mark eggs <laughs> all in one. So sometimes one person could have all those flaws. So you would have to identify which one have been asked to express. Pseudo precision, that's 11. Mm -hmm. False precision, misplaced precision, mathematical mystification. Take note, you will see that pseudo precision is also labeled as, as what? Mathematical mystification. Put the mass in the brim in so and mystifying us with the mass. You use statistical figures to suggest some precision be that is not there. Precision means exactness. You are, you are giving the impression that the thing is exact, it's precise. 60.992% of Ghanaians are spiritually motivated. How do we measure spiritual motivation, my dear friend? For you to come and tell me 75.38% of students are spiritually motivated. Spiritual motivation is vague. Vague here is not necessarily a, a derogatory, not necessarily a bad term. Yeah, I just show you that you can't easily define who is spiritually motivated and who is not. So what kind of research will now tell us that 75.38, a irritating part is even the 0.38, suggesting some exactness. Spiritual motivation is not mathematics. To have a you know conclusive, uh, it's not a closed system where you can have 7.238% of people being spiritually motivated. It is just a, a fake precision. You are pretending to be precise about something that cannot be precise. That's why we also call it mathematical mystification. See the several names it has. Look up. Over precision, mm -hmm. false precision, misplaced precision, mathematical mystification. We are saying you are pseudo. Remember pseudo scientific statement? A statement pretending to be verifiable or if you like testable, but it is not, it can never be false. It's pretending to be. So pseudo means pretending to be. So pseudo precision, pretending to be precise about a term or a notion that has no precision because of its nature, it is vague. See some example, in a recent two year survey, 75.38% of students at the University of Ghana were discovered to be spiritually motivated. So we can confidently suppose that over three quarters of Lagos students on campus today are spiritually motivated. Not only is the evidence necessarily uh, not co necessarily connected to this, what figures you are qualifying, okay? these figures are supposed to be qualifying a certain concept. The concepts are vague. Mm -hmm. You can't be precise about them. They are intentionally vague, like we learned in Unit 3. Okay. Let's see the second example. A tour guide at a museum says a dinosaur skeleton is exactly so and so and so years old. One million and five years old. I get that right. One billion and five years old. Because an expert told him that it was 100 million years old when he started working there five years ago. All the figures there, 100 million and five and a thousand, cannot qualify what the, the concept you are dealing with. That is what makes it. Let's read. Let's read. Exact statistical figures are used to characterize notions that cannot be expressed in exact or numerical terms, period. So you are putting figures and you are doing all you can to characterize notions, terms, eh? notions that cannot be expressed in exact or numerical terms. The concept itself cannot be exact. So your 75.38 you know, doesn't help matters. You're just mystifying us with the mathematics. And people, you know, people are mass phobia. So when you start saying 60.66% of Ghana so and so has done so, everybody takes you serious. Oh, the guy knows what he's talking about. You lie. It is mathematical mystification, or also called pseudo precision. We are almost done. Hold on. Then there is semi attached figure. Let's read. A statistic or figure is attached to a conclusion but it is irrelevant to the attribute featured in the conclusion 
or it is indirectly related to it. When the sample is not relevant to the hypothesis, the figures provided may just be partially related to the hypothesis. This is done to deflect attention. See, there's a, a certain similarity between this and pseudo precision. Still has to do with data and how you're manipulating it. Okay. Let's see some examples. If you want to sell your alcoholic drink as a cure for COVID-19, but can't actually prove that it works, then simply publish your laboratory report demonstrating that half an ounce of your drink killed 99% of germs in a test tube in under seven seconds. Now, all you need is a photo of a handsome doctor. <laughs> and the advertisement is ready to go. I don't think I'd, you might not see this well. Let's look at the, this one. Ghanaian university students are more intelligent than Nigerian students. This is also your text. I think it captures it better for me. Okay, Ghanaian university students are more intelligent than Nigerian students. A research team from Boston College discovered that at Legon, over the three year period, 75% of enrolled students had A's in English language. But in Ibadan, over the same period, only 58% of the students had A's in English language. We are talking A's in English language over a certain period. Take note, 2001 to 2004. Mm. And then others had A's in English language, 75% of them. For the period 2001 to 2004, then based on this, you conclude that Ghanaian university students are more intelligent than Nigerian students. Based on CU, based on a research conducted 2001 to 2004, in which field? In English only. You see, that is why we say it is a semi-attached figure. You haven't fully supported mm, uh, your conclusion. And it might not even be directly related to it. This is done to deflect attention from the subject matter and create the impression that the conclusion has been meticulously researched. You haven't. You can make claims about that based on your own English assessment hmm, for a period 2001 to 2004. Okay. Now, the very important point I wanted us to get to so that if there is any confusion in your mind, ah, but look, that, uh, that one could also have been this. Or it could also have been that. That's a good sign. You are so right. Because one passage could be committing several fallacies all at once. So if there can be multiply flawed reasoning. Example one, T. The terrorists who attacked the World Trade Center really shouldn't be blamed for their actions. They came from poor, struggling families oppressed by religion. You argue that terrorists should be punished, but you've always been a mean-spirited, stingy guy with no sympathy for anyone. <laughs> See our, our proposal. This is appealing to pity. Oh, don't blame them. They came from a poor starting back, so it's appeal to pity. Yet, you can see the tone of what at how many? You argue that terrorists should be punished, but you, you've always been a mean, you yourself, that you are talking. You are mean-spirited, you are a stingy guy, you don't have sympathy for anyone. So sympathy and poor and others seem to be appealing to pity, yet at the same time, attacking the person is logistic. At the minimum, it's logistic. You see that? That is why this is multiply flawed. You can even see some two cook there, I think. Maybe not directly. Okay. Then see another example of a multiply flawed reasoning. You say it's wrong for me to download music from the net without paying for it. That's crazy. Everybody's doing it. See, everybody's doing it. That's already appeal to the people or appeal to the masses. Mm -hmm. You know what's really wrong? There he goes. It's all these Kayaye who are being prosecuted for stealing from the electronic store. <laughs> these innocent women are living difficult lives and sometimes they barely make 10 Ghana cities a day. Appeal to pity. How do you expect them to buy mobile phones? Okay, all right. So you see why it can be multiple. So let's see a third one. We almost done. I have two slides to go. Example three, honey, either you buy me that five carat emerald ring or I'll have nothing to wear on this awfully bare finger. You do want to make me happy, don't you? Give me that ring and I'll love you for life. <laughs> I've the consequences already, the threat. See? Every good husband buys their wife emerald ring. Look at my friend, of course. She's very happy now that her husband bought her the ring. See, every good husband buys their wife emerald ring what everybody does. 
Look at my friend Akos. She's very happy now that her husband bought her the ring. You are basing this your conclusion, which is appealing to the masses. Itself is based on what? What you know about Akos and Sewa. It says, and Sewa too. You see, wives become unhappy. After knowing something about Akos and Sewa, there you go generalizing. So hasty generalization. See? So you appeal to people, you're appealing to threat, you're threatening the husband based on your appeal to what the masses do. And then you are even giving instances to make a claim about what wives do. Oh, you see, wives become unhappy because their husbands refuse to buy them emerald rings. I'm a wife and I don't belong to that set. That's a hasty <laughs> generalization. I would want to buy my own ring and even buy the guy something if you love it. Okay. So the thinking is not necessarily true for all claims, all instances of wives. That's a hasty generalization which was also appealing to the people and appealing to threats. Conclusion, a critical thinker would not be duped if armed with an awareness of the different ways there are to provide a motivation to believe a conclusion. Instead of being provided good logical reasons to believe that conclusion, we want logical reasons, not motivation, persuasion, manipulation. You see, don't motivate me. Motivation speaker, no, don't motivate me. Appeal to my reason, show me why, you see, so that I can make the decision myself. Don't tweak and tell, say, everybody is even doing this. Oh, you know, if we don't do that, what will happen to these poor children? Those are all motivation. Sometimes uh, manipulative, sometimes, uh, what's the other one? Persuasive, but they, they are not logical reasons. Okay, To accept a claim on the basis of some irrelevant psychological inducement, Fear, emotions, cultural beliefs, personal biases, linguistic and statistical manipulation is to fall short as a critical thinker. And we don't want you to fall short as a critical thinker. So we will continue to engage even after the course. You will continue to apply these wonderful concepts that you have learned where applicable okay, in your daily life. I'll see you this week again for our interactive sessions where you can bring all the various questions you may have on the topic for us to deliberate and together make our thinking and our reasoning better than we came in with. I think I enjoyed our sessions together. Wish you well. Read notices on your course site and make it in life all around. Have a wonderful stay and time on the University of Ghana campus. Take care.